Welcome to Chemistry 125. This, I dare say, is going to be the most enjoyable class you are going to have your entire college career. Chemistry 125 is Chemistry and Society Lab. This is a lab that is designed for the sole purpose of getting you to enjoy chemistry. First of all, my name is Dr. Kelly, and I want to go through a couple important things in the syllabus. First, this is an online class. Because it's online, the best way for you to contact me is online using a question and help message board. I'm required to give you my office phone number, but I'm never in my office. That's one of the reasons I, I, I teach so much online is due to other demands of the job. I am usually out running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Um, therefore, chances of catching me in my office are very, very slim. Therefore, you need to use message board. Don't leave a message for me, by the way, telling you me to give you a phone call. Um, again, it's just not really a good idea. Um, to try to talk about chemistry over the phone where we don't have that visual medium. So use that question help message board and I've got a whole section of the answer, um, whole section of the welcome lecture that goes into how to use that question help message board just because it's so important. Now I do answer email Monday through Friday. I take the weekends off guys. I've got a family too. Um, and I just need some downtime where I focus on them. So I answer um, email Monday through Friday. Couple quick exceptions is upon the occasional Friday, particularly over summer sessions, I have marathon lab sessions where I run a lab from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night. And on those Fridays, I won't answer email. I'll try to, and I won't be able to do it the following Saturday because I follow those Fridays up with a Saturday that's a 12 hour marathon because I hate myself. I do 24 hours in the lab, nonstop teaching um, for 48 hours straight. So those Fridays be aware I won't be answering emails. But basically it's Monday through Friday with the exception of um, basically two, two Fridays the entire year that I wasted too much time talking about for, for two Fridays a year. Um, Warning, I don't do it as much in lab as I do in lecture, but because this is a dealing with society and societal issues and I am addicted to pop culture, I love pop culture. I spend my time, um, in my spare time, I go to, to different comic cons and I, I, heroes and villains, Nashville, uh, Walker Stalker, um, Indie PopCon, you name it, I've been there. Lexington Comic Con's a favorite. So I, I can't help but reference pop culture. And if I show you a clip, it may contain cursing, violence, drug use, and or um, reproduction. Now I'm not gonna show you anything. I, I'm not gonna show you porn, right? Um, basically, if, if AMC would show it, I consider it fair game, right? American Movie Classic Channel, the channel that shows Breaking Bad and um, The Walking Dead. If they would show it on those shows, then I consider it fair game in the class, right? In other words, it may get rated R. Not going to get rated X, but it may get rated R. But even then, it would kind of be a soft R just because, well of my proclivities there. Um, the purpose of this class is to reinforce things taught in the lecture. I will often make reference to things that you've learned in lecture in the pre-labs. So you need to kind of, kind of keep up with the schedule of both classes. This class doesn't influence what happens in 120, but 120 definitely influences what happens in here. So try to keep up on your lecture um, work as well. Scrolling through academic stuff they make me put in. Question help, more on that later. 
Oh, make sure that when you do send me an email that you post on that question help message board and say, hey, Dr. Kelly, I sent you an email. Preferably, you can ask the question on the question help message board, but if it's personal and you don't want to share it with everybody, then go ahead and send me an email, but post a message saying that you sent an email because things have a bad, bad tendency to get lost in my spam box and get overlooked. Again, uh, without going into too much detail due to my current position, I, I, reserve, I receive well over 100 emails a day. Your email might get lost if you don't post on that question help message board. If it's on that question help message board, I use it to help organize my workflow. So make sure that you do post there when you send me a question. Course material, listen up. Matter of fact, I'm so convinced I want you to um, listen up. Why don't you write down Superman? Write down Superman. And let's talk about your course materials. Your course materials are available through the Elizabethtown Bookstore. That's the easiest way to get them. Or through KCTS Bookstore. Let's go on the journey together of finding them. Let me go to the web browser here. Come on, web browser. All right. Go to your college's homepage. They've redesigned these homepages. Current students. Uh, my path, library, account, bookstore. Let's try the distance learning bookstore. So we're in the KCTCS Technical College online bookstore. Click textbook. See, we went to KCTCS online, textbooks, find textbooks. Select term, select, or select a campus, try KCTCS online. We may have to go to Elizabethtown, we'll find out. Select your term, select your department. This is chemistry. Select your course, Chemistry 125. It's important that you get the right section. If you're in Elizabethtown, it's going to be a 25Z something. So make sure that you're choosing one of those 25Zs. Click Find Material. Do, 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 do. You have two pieces of required equipment. You have your chemistry kit, this chemistry chem C1000 version two. And this is actually Barnes and Noble did it hit this one out of the out of the park. They are actually underselling Amazon on this item. So I am very, very proud and very happy of them and very thankful for them doing so i don't recommend that you buy it used just because you have no idea if they've returned all the chemicals and most importantly they might not have returned the instruction booklet in which case you're in real trouble but this has your kit this is your kit this is where most of your chemicals come from and most of your experiments will be conducted using this kit Chemical splash goggles. You have to buy a pair of chemical splash goggles for yourself. If you are going to have anybody help you with these experiments, i.e. your children, because some of these are going to be really fun. I mean, we're going to make colored milk and a couple other things before the end of the semester. If you're going to have anybody help you like your children, they need to have chemical splash goggles too. Your bookstore charges $7 for chemical splash goggles. Chemical splash goggles 
maybe they can be found cheaper somewhere else. <coughs> um, but if you do go outside from the bookstore, if you go any place other than the bookstore to get your chemical splash goggles, make sure that they say chemical splash goggles on the picture. Oh, come on. Where's my picture? Oh, no. They're not giving me a picture. Let's see. I thought they had a picture. Real time lecturing. Bum, bum, bum. Come on. Uh, wonderful. All right. They don't have a picture. That's fine. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Ooh, excitement. It's loading. It's loading. It's loading. It's loading. Don't buy them from here. Buy them from the bookstore. But I just wanted you guys to be able to see a chemical splash goggles should look like this, right? There should be not a bunch of little holes. If you if you work in a wood shop, you'll often see goggles with a bunch of little holes all the way around the side. Those aren't chemical splash goggles. Those are wood chipper goggles. Chemical splash goggles all have no vents except for the four vents that look like this. Some pairs will only have two vents. But even these vents are designed in such a way that while they allow air in, they make it very difficult for any liquid to get in to pre protect your eyes from accidental spills. 90% of the danger in chemistry lab is getting something in your eyes. If you get something on your hand, it may hurt like crazy. Um, but skin heals, right? If you let it stay on too long, it may eat through muscle and bone, in which case that won't heal too well. But what I'm saying is most of what's done to your body can be repairable. What's not repairable is what would be done to your eyes. So always wear those chemical splash goggles. If you have anybody help you on the fun experiments, they need to be wearing chemical splash goggles too. As long as we're talking about that, Um, I would not recommend that you have children help you with the chemist chemical experiments from that kit. Find textbooks, KCTCS online, chemistry, select course again, 125. I would not have your kids help you with any of the experiments from this kit. The, I'm sorry, my email keeps interrupting the lecture. I would not have the, any of the children help you, your children help you with the experiments from this kit. This kit does contain some pretty strong poisons and some things that can cause minor skin irritation. Another thing you might consider is, well, you can find gloves, like surgical gloves or something to protect your hands if you want to, but they're not required. As I said, just wash your hands, but I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, we'll get into safety in another video, but I would not have children help you with chemicals from this lab, just, just a heads up there. Where was I? The only cat, only labs that I would have your kids help you with is we're going to um, play with Easter eggs during this this course. We're going to play with some slime. We're going to do some fun things that would be more kid appropriate there. And I understand if you want to have your kids help you with like slime and stuff, but they need to be wearing goggles when they do so. Okay. 
So that's where you get your books. You have to get the kit. You have to get the chemical splash goggles. I require you to turn in pictures for a lot of things. Um, if I see you turn in any pictures where you're not wearing goggles, I will deduct massive points. Also, grading, speaking of points, just like in lecture, I don't grade on percentage, like 90% is an A, 80% is a B, uh -uh, uh -uh. I grade on total points. To get an A, all you have to do is 519 points or whatever amount is shown here. Notice I say whatever amount is shown here in your syllabus. Matter of fact, let me put that in right here. I am always tinkering with this course. Every semester, my syllabus is just a little bit different on things like total number of points. Check your own syllabus in the course shell for the um, grading points. But you get above a certain number of points shown right there. You get an A. You get in the point range shown right here. You get a B. You get below that number of points, you get an E. Wait, Dr. Kelly, what about C's and what about D's? No. This class is really almost a participation class. So really, you're participating or you're not participating. Also, the way I have these points designed is they're designed to have you do between, have you do about 10 to 11 experiments. You should be able to do 10 to 11 experiments and get all these points. What do I mean by 10 to 11 experiments so that there's no miscommunication? You'll notice in the course shell, right below your syllabus, you'll see a link to a course schedule. This course schedule has lab one, lab two, lab three, lab four, lab five, lab six, lab seven. You should be able to do 10 to 11 of the labs that I have listed here. And eventually, I think on the one I'm showing to you right now, it's partial and I only have 10. By the end of the week, I'll have added a couple, couple more, if not three more. If you do 10 of those labs, you should be able to accumulate enough points to get an A. It is your responsibility to keep track of the number of points. And by that, I mean you're not supposed to be adding them up in your head, but you can always check. Come on. You can always check your grades in Blackboard. All the grades will be kept in Blackboard. Matter of fact, I will see if I can't provide a grade link for you right here in the course menu, but you will always have access to my grade book. So you'll always know what your grade is. If you want, once you break that threshold for an A, if you want to email me and say, hey, I think I've got an A in the class, can you confirm? Or I think I have a B in the class, can you confirm? And I'll say yes, or I'll say no. So check with me if you're in doubt about what your grade is, but keep track of those total number of points. They'll actually rack up fairly quickly. Late work. First of all, every class has a different drop dead date, and it's always listed here in red in the syllabus. There is a date by which all work has to be in. No exceptions grandmother deaths, deaths, car wrecks, hospitalizations, doesn't matter. Not because I'm a mean person, not because I'm trying to make life difficult for you, but because I am required to submit grades myself. I have to submit my grades myself. In order to submit my grades, I have to have your work done in by that time. And of course, that time is going to be different. Uh, depending on what semester you're taking it. Oh, this syllabus already has a mistake. That should obviously not be. 
That just needs to change. Oh, here it is. I put it in there twice since it's so important. If you have a computer malfunction, I understand that it happens. It's not happening as much as it used to. Blackboard now actually works pretty well. Don't tell Blackboard I said that. But the number of times Blackboard will cause you an issue is very small, and those are usually occurring at the beginning of the semester. For example, you may have your pop-up blocker on for Blackboard, and you need to turn that off because my tests are always pop-ups. I will reset three things for you during the course of the semester due to computer malfunctions. After three times, I'm going to penalize you 10% of the assignment grade. No one who knows how to use a computer or has a computer that works reasonably is going to need more than three items reset. Most people go through the entire semester without me having them reset one thing. Therefore, if you are having more than three things reset, you are a statistical anomaly, and it makes me question why you are having so many things reset. So after three things, it's a 10% point penalty. Also, strikes are not rights. The instructor has the sole discretion of granting strikes. In other words, if I just don't feel like it, I can say, nope, no soup. So be aware of that. Withdrawal policy, I have a withdrawal date here. You have to contact me by that date. It'll be different in your syllabus, probably. You have to contact me by that date if you want to withdraw from the class successfully. That's not something I'm going to say, oh, no, you contacted me 10 minutes late on. But withdrawal is always a different song and dance every single semester. The colleges find more and more ways to complicate what should be a fairly simple process. So in order to ensure that you have enough time to complete the paperwork, I recommend that you contact me no later than that date. If you contact me after that date and the bureaucracy holds you up, I'm not going to help. I'm not going to move mountains for you, right? Course extensions, I just don't give them, period. There's a bunch of reasons for this. First and foremost, when I first started teaching, I gave anybody who asked for a course extension a course extension. And when I went back and counted, I, at one point, I had given over 100 course extensions and only had one of them pass. So I don't give eyes. Don't um, ask for one. Safety violation. If you commit a safety violation, I will fail you in the class or at very least the experiment. How can you commit a safety violation? Well, I'm going to have you submit photographic evidence a lot of times. And if you, I see you not wearing safety goggles in those pictures, boom, points off. If I see you being dressed inappropriately in those videos, points off. I won't accept experiments. I won't grade your work product if you don't take that pre-lab. All your assignments, and we'll go into them, are going to have pre-labs with them. If you don't complete the pre-lab, I won't grade the experiment. Didn't say you had to pass the pre-lab. I just said you need to complete it, by the way. But most of that pertains to my face-to-face -face sections. How to take this course for every lab you're going to read the instructions in the Chemical C1000 manual. That box, and we'll go through an unboxing videos. I love unboxing videos, by the way. I'm like addicted to them. Not so much now that NerdBlock's gone bankrupt, but anyway, I digress. For every lab, you're going to read the instructions in the Chem C1000 manual. You're going to listen to a pre-lab lecture. You're going to take a pre-lab quiz. 
you're going to reread those lab instructions. Reread your lab instructions. You're going to prepare your area, wear your safety goggles, and conduct the experiment. You're going to clean up after the experiment so that no one else accidentally gets hurt. You're going to take the post lab quiz and turn in any required photographs. Do not do any experiments until they are assigned. In other words, don't read ahead in this instruction manual. There are some experiments that I consider not worth the risk, and therefore I'm not putting in those experiments. If you have issues such as disability, uh, code of conduct, other things, the information can be found at the following web address. That's it for the syllabus. Let's deal a little bit more with how you're going to take the course on a daily basis. And to do that, let's go to your Blackboard shell. Do, 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 do. First of all, first, of first and most importantly, you're going to see your safety information. And that's where your safety video and a bunch of safety quiz, another safety quiz, safety waiver are all located. Next, you're going to find your labs. Your labs are divided by, up by experiments to match what you see on the schedule. So let's take a look at this schedule document. Lab one is reading the syllabus, which you're doing now. Lab two is the safety information. And gosh darn it, I need to change those dates. Okay, I've got a little bit of work to do. What you'll also notice is in addition to the lab, title lab one, lab two, lab three, in here you have the assignment and that tells you the things you'll be doing for that lab. Then you have a location that tells you where in Blackboard to find the experiment. This is the date you should do the lab. This is the date after which the lab is considered late and subject to a late penalty. Date you should do it, the emergency date. That's the date after which something is considered late. By the way, I don't give penalty-free extensions. Because I'm giving you roughly a week between the day that you should do a lab and the day that you should turn it in, the fact that you got sick or got in a car wreck or something like that's not rele relevant because you had a whole week to do it in. So to be absolutely scrupulously fair to everyone, I don't give penalty-free extensions. So let's move down here to lab three. Okay, so lab three. You're supposed to do lab three on this day. To do lab three, you're going to go to labs, section three, experiment one to eight. So on your Blackboard shell, you'd come over here in Blackboard. See me? Woo! See the floating hand? Labs right there. Labs. Section three, experiments one to eight. You're going to have a pre-lab lecture and that pre-lab lecture will be on YouTube. And if you haven't had me before in these pre-lab lectures, I do fun filled things like tell you to Write down the word Batman. Everybody write down the word Batman. And I'll tell you to write down those words and, and then I'll ask you about them. So you have to listen to those words, the um, pre-lab lectures. The pre-lab lectures also contain the basic important scientific information. The billions and billions behind the experiment. So you have to watch those. Watching the pre-lab lecture does not alleviate the need to read your lab annual. I do not go through your instructions step-by-step step in that pre-lab lecture. Let me be very clear on that. 
I do not go step by step through the laboratory procedures in those pre-lab lectures. You need to read the lab manual carefully. The lab manual is the place where you get your instructions. After you've listened to my lecture and read the lab manual, take the pre-lab experiment quiz and those pre-lab experiment quizzes will be in mixtures. You'll have to write the keywords that I told you. Um, you'll have to answer questions based on the science behind it. And those questions can come not only from the pre-lab pre -lab, um, lecture, but they can also come from the reading in that lab manual. So make sure that you read those lab manuals. Then to turn in a lab report, what you're going to do is most lab reports are require you to submit pictures. So I have a Word document here. You'll click it, you'll download the Word document. Open it up. See, turn in, take a picture of the filter after the water has passed through, paste picture here. So you're going to take a picture that you've taken on your cell phone and you're going to paste it in right there. So you'll paste it right in there and you can paste pictures enable editing. You can paste pictures, of course, very easily. Insert pictures, right? So insert a picture. Experiment two, you're going to paste another picture there, paste another picture there, here. Right, paste the pictures for the experiments, and you'll see for this lab you're doing set. You're, you have to paste seven different pictures. Oh, whoops, even more, eight different pictures. You're going to paste those pictures into the Word document. Save it to your computer after you pasted those pictures, and save it to your computer. Then come over here, click this button. See where it says right up here, right above where you, you downloaded the document here. Click that, and it's going to ask you to attach a file. So you're going to go to your computer and upload the document that you just saved your pictures into. And then you're going to hit Submit. And I'll come along and grade it, hopefully. Um, just so you know, I tend to do my grading in chunks. So once a week, I'll sit down and I will plow through all my online classes. So it may be every Tuesday night or it may be every Wednesday morning, but I usually do it the same time roughly every week. So if you haven't seen anything graded in six days, don't panic. Yell at me if it hasn't been graded after eight days. But give me seven days to grade things here. I give you seven days before I consider something late. So give me at least seven days before you consider my grading late. And that's basically what every single lab is going to be like. You're going to have a mixture of labs based on the kits. For example, this one, this one, this one are all kit based. Then you're going to have some that are non kit based. For example, the slime, the catalyst, the excellent surfactants, and I'm going to try to make it a 50-50 option. option. And what labs you may be seeing may be differing depending on the semester. I'd like to develop a large enough catalog that the labs are actually seasonal so that you're doing like, I don't know, 4th of July labs during the summer and uh, flowers and eggs and rabbits during the spring and turkey and snow and ice formation and stuff during Christmas. But that, that's just where I want to take this thing eventually here. I'm getting ahead of myself. But that's basically all that there is to the class. I can't think of anything else to say, which is unbelievable. So I am going to shut up now, for which you are all very grateful. Make sure you listen to the second part of the 
welcome lecture on the question and help message board. And I look forward to seeing the results of your experiments and getting to know you a little bit. That's it.